sister and a sister in every sense of the word, but she's also a powerhouse of a woman, and you understand why. Nana Konama, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> wow, that was such a, I feel like I have so much to you know, answer to now for no, your but, introduction. But you, 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 no, so now I had to live up to you when oh. I was introducing you. Come on. <laughs> Mutual admiration. You. Good to see. Thank you. Great seeing How are you doing? I'm well, well, yeah. considering um, I slept late and woke up early, but I'm good. I'm, I'm well. We didn't wake you up too early, did we? No, you know what? I, as long as I get to be in this segment with you, I'm, I'm joyful oh, and happy and I'm, I'm ready. Grateful. So, Nana Konoma Boating, before we even get to you, the woman, the adult mm -hmm. that I know and admire, and I'm sure by the time we're done, our viewers will be in love with, let's talk about how you grew up. Who is Nana Konoma? What was it like growing up? Ooh, wow. Um, so, I was born and raised in Ghana. I was born up the street from here, good old Kolobutijin Hospital. And um, when I was nine years old, we moved um, to the States. So before we moved, um, I lived here, mom, dad, um, three older siblings, okay. and uh, went to Christ the King. Oh, yeah, CTK girl, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> went to Christ the King, um, but before that, I went to Little Flowers. So oh. that, was, that was the origin, so that was the beginning. Um, and uh, we had, you know, just like your, I, I don't think my upbringing was, was special or unusual. We had okay. the usual sort of like two-parent household. Mm. Um, I don't want to say usual to, to assume, yeah. but for me, sort of I had the two-parent household, um, older siblings, all going to the same Catholic school, <laughs> um, and uh, living in, in Teixeira and running around barefoot. And oh. some of really the best years of my life, when I was nine years old, we moved to the States, and that was a huge adjustment. Mm. Um, and my family uh, moved right outside of Washington, D.C. Okay. So we moved in a super diverse neighborhood where mm. everybody was an immigrant. Yeah. And so that was a blessing as well because you didn't feel... The culture shock wasn't as big as it could have no, been. Yeah, right? you know, it, I mean, I imagine if we moved to like the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, like in Maine somewhere. Like Maine, mm. You know, I still haven't been to Maine. I'm from the East Coast, too, and i never, never done Maine. But I was thinking more Indiana. Like, I don't know. Idaho. Like, I Rural feel like America could have been worse, you yeah. know? So um, I was grateful to be raised outside of Washington, D.C. Very strong Ghanaian community, so we okay. were always close. Um, my, my family, my father, my parents had friends um, in the Ghanaian diplomatic community, and okay. so we were very tapped in okay. um, on, on some level. So it was like a nice little mix. Now, what year was this, if you can remember? Yeah, absolutely. We left in 1997. Okay, so you left in 97. Yes. And, I mean, what, what, what took your family to the U.S. in the first place? Honestly, you should ask my dad. I really don't. You know, they don't tell you anything when you're they a don't. kid. And my dad to this day tells the story about how we were living in the States and I looked at him. I was like, why did you bring us here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> why did you bring us to this country? Because life was different. I mean, we went from, you know, a two-story house with like a big yard to yes. like a condo, yes. um, which is a very normal sort of family setup. Like, you know, three-bedroom yeah. condo is a exactly. very normal thing in, in, in America. But like, for kids who had like a yard and everything else. You could run like, around, <laughs> you could bath in the backyard you if you know? wanted to. It was completely, it was different in those terms. Okay. But then I think children were wired to sort of adapt. Mm. Um, you don't have as, as a larger frame of reference and so you can create life um, for as you see it. And mm. I really sat down with my dad and I was like, why did you bring us here? Mm. <laughs> but I mean, so this is young you. Yeah. And you're still, at that point, very conscious of your environment and the nuances. Mm -hmm. um, we're living in a time of racial turbulence. That's what I like to call Oof. it. What was it like for a nine-year-old you moving mm -hmm. to the U.S.? I know you did live in, a, in quite a diverse community, yeah. but through the years, uh, what was it like being an African woman in America? Yeah. I think that's, you know, I always... When people ask me this question, I really have to reach back mm -hmm. and, and think about it because, you know, as a kid, a lot of things yeah. kind of just completely goes over your head. Because you're innocent. Yes, you can't, you don't really receive it. But I remember my mother always complaining that I speak the king's English. Why is everybody <laughs> treating me like I don't speak English? And I think the moment people would hear your accent, especially in America, where um, the, expo the irony mm -hmm. of America is that as many cultures and, you know, ethnicities as are represented there, um, 
there's still this sense that you leave where you are to become American, yeah. right? There's, in, there's, 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 there's a push or at least the illusion mm. that one must ascribe to Americanism. Exactly. And so you, you hear that a lot. Yeah. Oh, um, in America, we do things like this. In America, we say things like this. And there is sort of that, there's a lot of that language mm. going around. Um, so for us, you know, my mother was like, okay, well, you, you guys can speak English outside, but we spoke to your <laughs> home, um, partly because my father was back and forth. My dad um, okay. still had his business in Ghana, so okay. my dad never left okay. completely. So my mom um, was like, okay, we're going to speak to your home. You're just going to be yourself, live your life, um, and just be proud of who you are and where, where you're from. Mm -hmm. So as far as the racial dynamic, it was what was alarming was the anti-blackness mm. that you experience from other brown people yeah that one is new because you're like but we're all brown yeah. and i like when i first moved to the states in fourth grade fourth fourth grade i was racially abused by a group of indian kids mm. um and i'll never forget this day it was actually looking back and it was kind of funny but my um they 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 what was it? Water guns. Like okay. they basically yeah. abused me with water guns, and so so they basically they ganged up on you and started shooting you with water guns. Started shooting me water guns, and these were wow. girls I used to walk to school with. Like I thought we were friends or whatever. Wow. Um, and it was really funny because I was with a couple other white kids, and they were enraged. I remember my friend Megan, this little white girl, she literally walked me home and was like, "I'm telling your mom." Um, and my mom was like, "Megan, take me there." And my mm. mother actually walked to. Um, where these girls lived. It wasn't too far from where we lived. It was like an, another condo complex not far from ours. She actually walked there and um, just told the mother, she said, we go, th like, we're brown people. We're all immigrants. Like, we get nothing out of fighting one another. Mm -hmm. And you need to teach your daughters that, like, that, like, that is important. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was really, like, first of all, I was like, well, my mother, because <laughs> this was twice. My sister had already gone to shake the girls. <laughs> Then my mom went to talk to the parents. So, so the African girls are just everywhere shaking people. Yeah, just people. shaking people. <laughs> so it was, I look back on that with a lot of a sense of pride that like, mm -hmm. wow, like my people really stepped up. Because mm -hmm. I didn't even want to talk about it. My mm -hmm. sister, I thought when my sister dealt with the girls, it was enough because she's my older sister. But then when my mom got home, Megan decided to let them know. Megan was my friend mm -hmm. uh, from the neighborhood. So it's good to have allies. <laughs> it is, always. So what was it like in school, for example? I mean, young you again, uh, you, had, you were in Christ the King, Catholic mm -hmm. school. Yeah. Um, and then I, I don't, did, were you in a private school in the public U.S.? School, or public girl, school, okay. I so, went to public school. So what school. was that transition like? <laughs> um, I remember being surprised or like, okay, so before we started school, because we arrived in the States maybe April and school didn't start to September. Okay. So we had sort of been around some of the Abroche kids, the Ghanaian okay. Abroche kids who have, <laughs> who, you know, uh, oriented us in, in all, all, ma all the manners of disrespect mm. that we can take mm. on as, as Abroche children. But um, so we, you know, going to school, I think I had a little bit of what I needed to expect because of cousins, yeah. of course, and church families and, and whatnot who would, who we sort of had been able to observe for months before we started school. So I made friends. I got, I really lucked out. I have to say there was a Ghanaian lady working at my school. Okay. And As she, a teacher? Um, she was part of the custodial staff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And she, when we, I remember getting there and the, we went to orientation um, and we saw her. And my parents, I don't know how <laughs> the news was connected. Yeah. It was very much Somehow like Somehow you always know this connection. I think my dad was like, mm, that he just went up to her and it was like she ended up being Ghanaian. And um, she was super sweet and introduced me to, to really, like really one of the few other black girls, um, this girl called, you know, Chardell Moore. And she um, was Caribbean. Okay. She had come from, the, she, she had moved from the Caribbean very young. Mm. But she also had that sense of, oh, yeah, I'm black, but I am, like, other yeah. black. Yeah. Um, we immediately became best friends. She was very chatty. To this day, my father <laughs> is convinced that she's the reason I talk so much. So <laughs> I can't shake it. It's been over 20 years. So I, for me, she became a bit of an anchor and a shield mm -hmm. because she was 
a little bit more of my identity mm -hmm. as well. So I really have been blessed in my journey to not feel completely like an outsider. Right. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about your journey through education to, because now you're a businesswoman, you've been through so many things and we'll be talking about <laughs> them, you know, but what was your journey like through education, um, just through life, getting to the point where now you launched a new brand during a pandemic. During a pandemic, that yeah. crazy girl. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what, what has the journey been like? Oh, wow. So, um, you know, typical immigrant family household, the expectation is come home with good grades. However you mm -hmm. get those grades, mm -hmm. it's not, it's Just not make sure my they're business. Good. Uh, so I kind of did the usual thing. I was... Very blessed to have had a good, I believe I had a great foundation from okay. Christ the King. Um, yes, it's a little <laughs> plug for I felt I had a great foundation. So, uh, you know, education-wise, especially in math and science, mm. we're actually ahead in Ghana. Oh, yes, we are. We're yeah. very much ahead in Ghana. Yeah. So I went to a fourth grade class that was um, like a little behind okay. mathematically and okay. science, science, math and science mm. speaking. Um, but... You know, so that helped me get into advanced classes. Okay. You know, they, they tier. Yeah. In America, I don't know how to do it in Ghana, but in, in America, they tier. Yeah. So they kind of have, you know, the, the basic or just the regular classes. Yes. And they have a pro program called um, GT, which is oh. Gifted and Talented. Right. And then they have honors and they have advanced. So I was always in sort of like the Gifted, Talented, Honors, oh, Advanced, advanced. Classes, oh. which I, I feel like is, is owed, owing to my foundation here in Ghana. Okay. So I... <laughs> I um, <laughs> I was always kind of ahead of my, my <laughs> classmates in that in that mo not all my classmates most of my classmates except for, and that felt a little lonely because mm. often I was the only one who looked like me. I was usually the only black person or the black girl or African in some mm. of these spaces, and sometimes it did feel a bit lonely. Um, and then I would go to my classes that were not the advanced classes, yeah. and I'll feel smart in everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I, I, I um, you know, we had a l people around us oh. who oriented my parents to say, hey, listen, they love to put black children into remedial classes. Okay. So you have to be very adamant mm. and forceful with your, with your children. So my parents were very forceful with us to okay. always go with the harder subjects right. because it was like, no, you have to, you know, the typical work twice as hard. Yes, exactly. Right. So um, through, you know, junior high, senior high, um, then I, I went through the typical, okay, you're smart, math and science. So... Be a doctor, be a doctor. Right? So like every African parent, be a Guinean doctor. parent, be a doctor. So that was what I was sort of oriented my training towards. Okay. So university came around. Um, I majored in biology. So mm -hmm. I have a bachelor's of science in, in biology, biochemistry, worked in a biochemistry lab um, during my time there. I <laughs> uh, was very interested in health and wellness, and so I started doing um, work specifically in sexual reproductive health. So okay. I was working, um, I did quite a bit of volunteer work and outreach work in the HIV AIDS sector, mm -hmm. um, and even went to South Africa um, and did study abroad in South Africa specifically for HIV AIDS work, and H worked at an HIV AIDS clinic in a township in Durban, okay. South Africa. Uh, and after that, I went and got my master's degree um, from Columbia University, a master's in public health. Um, global health and policy uh, and literally the moment I graduated I was like I'm moving to Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> why? So why that decision? Because yeah. a lot of people don't understand why you would go through the motions, mm -hmm. go th to some of the best schools that yeah. the U.S. has to offer. I mean yeah. people all over the world are clamoring to get into schools like this mm -hmm. and then you get the degrees and you're coming back to Ghana. People can't understand that. So why that decision? Um, you know, there are a few factors. One, my parents were always told us that, like, we're going back. Mm. This is just to set you up for some... They felt there were some opportunities we could take okay. advantage of at that time. Um, because the 90s, I think, were a bit tumultuous education-wise. So my parents right. were like, yeah. we'll just give you guys a little bit of stability. But the, 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 So everybody's back. All my siblings. Oh, everybody, everybody. The whole family. Yeah, because we were always told that you had to come back. Mm. So it was always, you know... It's like location services. It's kind of running. <laughs> it's always running in the background. 
So everything we did was with the understanding that you would have to move, oh. move back. Um, so after I graduated, this is, I didn't realize this is what happened until now that I'm thinking, I was knew I was going to move back. Mm -hmm. I was, that was, I knew I was also going to move back. Um, and so a few things were happening. I was like, okay, I can either stay here and do the, the job hustle, like mm -hmm. all my classmates, or I can go back to Ghana where my family has a business and at the very least I'll have a job. Yeah. So there was that. And then, you know, something crazy happened in the summer of 2013. Okay. There was the trial of, for the murder of Trayvon Martin. That's right, because he had been killed in 2012. Yeah. And then that summer, I remember yeah. exactly where I was when the news came out that um, this guy had been acquitted. Mm. And I remember feeling extremely resolved in that moment in my decision to move back like mm. that year. I was just waiting for my lease to be up in New York City and I was like, Deuce, literally deuces. Mm. So I always knew I was going to come back. I had already made a decision to move in 2013, but in that moment when the acquittal of his murderer came mm. i was just like this there's just nothing yeah, holding I me mean, here there's this much evidence that a, a, a 70 year old right. black kid was killed was murdered, and then the exactly. murder you know for no yeah. reason and uh, just because he was presumed yeah. or assumed Perceived yeah. or whatever the case is and you know the person this, who killed him was set free set then free. you i mean could be his, me. his entire existence was weaponized and mm -hmm. i think when you look at it like that, because I remember that very night, um, Barack Obama had a press conference, mm -hmm. and it's very rare for a president to have a press conference about a, a trial that's mm -hmm. happened in Florida, of all places. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> what do we really expect? <laughs> what yeah. is, what could one expect from Florida? And for him to say, hey, look, I was Trayvon. Trayvon could have been me. Trayvon could have yeah. been president. When he yeah. said that, it really, it just settled in me. Mm -hmm in a very real way. And I was like, well, I've already made a decision to move back, but I don't think there's anything that will make me change that decision right. at this point. So then I, I brought my, my butt back. I <laughs> left all my... Because sometimes I looked on LinkedIn and I see uh, some of what like, my, my Ivy League classmates are doing I have done. And a lot of them are having the dream jobs we talked about mm -hmm. in school. And I, every now and then I might daydream, but then I'm just like, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> So in 2013, so your family moved to the U.S. in 97. Yes. 2013, that would have meant you'd been out of the States for about 16 years. Yes. You're coming back an adult woman. Again, another transition, big transition in your life. How did you sail through it? I didn't. <laughs> I didn't sail through. I thank you for being honest about that. I didn't that. sail through. So what were your experiences like? What were the challenges? Oh, wow. Um, every stage brings this challenge. Mm -hmm. And I, once again, every point of my journey, I've just been given people, people have come into my path mm -hmm. who've made it easier. So I happen to, I wouldn't say stumble, but I know it's not a coincidence. I happened to, through, through old friends from Christ okay. the King that I kept in touch with, um, make acquaintance and make friends with, with a group of young women who were just about my age or a little bit older who also had my experience. Some of them had even been born in America mm -hmm. and had no, like nothing, at least I had like a, my parents, a house in East Ligon mm -hmm. I could come to, you know, but I met friends who, you know, just got up and moved after mm -hmm. being born in the U.S. or Canada and just came and they were roommates together and mm -hmm. they were just figuring life out. And we had the comfort of, of, of doing Accra together <laughs> um, from a very similar frame of reference, mm. a very similar frame of reference. And so there was always that sense that like we could vent our Ghanaisms or, or whatever it is um, but it, it hasn't been easy. I think that there, 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 it is a journey. Mm. There is the initial excitement. Nothing can phase you. You're here. You're just experiencing it. You're loving it. As time goes on, there is the frustration. Absolutely. And then there is, if I had to go through the, 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 the five or six stages of moving back <laughs> to Ghana, there's the excitement. Then there's the frustration. Then there's, there's disenchantment. And mm. then... 
if we're not careful, it kind of goes into disillusionment. Mm. And I feel like disillusionment is usually the turning point. Mm. Mm. You either That's when you decide how you want to exist here. And I know a lot of people, and disillusionment usually comes around the two and a half, three year mark. <laughs> I always tell people, look, if you can make two and a half, three years. You can do it. You, you got this. Mm. There's disenchantment and that disillusionment is a turning point. Um, and then I feel like there's discovery. Mm. And I think what I went through was like, oh, so all of this wasn't for me to necessarily, how do I put this? Like, I think the arrogance of a lot of us who move back is that yeah. we're coming to change something. Yes. Mm. Um, but Ghana teaches you that, oh, no, no, Ghana teaches you in, a, in such a beautiful way because coming back, being here, I was just talking to someone about this like a week or two ago. Ghana is not about what you can change mm. outside. Ghana is about what you can change inside. That's very profound. 100%. How so? Oh, gosh. I think that when you come to a place and you make a dis like, first of all, respect the place for, like, what I've learned is, like, to respect the space for what it is and respect and accept Ghana on its own journey. Mm. And um, just like any place, this place has incredible lessons to teach us. Absolutely. And I think when we put down that armor of I know better and it could be better and this is how, yes, that's all true, 100%. I, I don't think we should discount that. But I think that Ghana helps you discover who you truly are, at least for <laughs> me and for other people who return like me. Because if you weren't, if you're not a, you know, in the States, you can hide behind a lot of things. Mm. I can hide behind a good education. I can hide behind a lease. I don't, nobody owns anything in no, America. <laughs> if, if, I keep saying that people in America who die without actually owning, owning. blenders, something as simple as it's that. Some, something that you can, yeah. you can hide behind your leased luxury vehicle. You can mm. hide behind a mortgage. You can hide behind great credit cards. Mm. Ghana is not, for me, at least my, in my experience, it's not a place you can hide behind a lot of things. Mm. So if you're an impatient person, Ghana, I feel like this is a place that will teach you patience. Okay. Um, if you, Ghana also opened my eyes to my own prejudices mm. and my own privileges, right? So living in America, it's very easy to be like, oh, um, I'm, I'm a black woman, African woman. Um, I represent sort of like an underrepresented group. Mm. Then I move to Ghana and it's like, okay, I'm coming with this abroche attitude, abroche <laughs> education, abroche accent. Mm. That comes with its own sort of like levers mm. and doors and, and spaces um, and expectations. Mm. And so all of a sudden you have to switch your mind to be like, oh my God, I'm, I'm of a privileged group. Yes. And so it, it reveals... For me, it's revealed my prejudices to me. Okay. It's revealed my uh, my blind spots mm. to me. It's revealed to me the spaces within myself that need to grow mm. and evolve. It's revealed to me, you know, the parts of me that I, I love and the parts of me I like to improve. Okay. Let's talk about your fibroid campaign. Mm. How did that begin? And I know you have a personal mm. journey yeah. to share yes. on that note. Yeah, so um, with fibroids, honestly, I found out I had a fibroid. I have found out I had fibroids. And I'm giggling. How long ago was this? Late 2018. Okay, so fairly recent. Yeah, fairly recent. I found out I had and you fibroids. you were in Ghana then? I was in Ghana. I was moved. Mm. Compl oh, at that point, I was like, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is home. <laughs> this is home. This is where I'm set up. There isn't, I, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is... I think of 2018 yeah. in America. <laughs> <laughs> so well. I was going back to that, you know. So um, found out I had fibroids uh, through really like a pregnancy at the time. So mm -hmm. the the doctor, God bless her heart, was like, oh, but she was so flippant. Like she was like, oh, we all get them. It's so common a black woman. Like you know. So I remember looking at her like, like, are you serious? <laughs> like this. There was no mention of the position. There was no mention of sort of like what it could potentially cause. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's like, oh, but don't worry. Everybody gets fibroids. You're going to be fine. Um, you know, maybe four weeks after that, I got a miscarriage because of fibroids. 
And uh, I remember just being really pissed off. I was angry at everybody. I was angry at the lady. I felt like going down there with sneakers on and like getting her face Do about I it. Do I see tears in your eyes? Are you, am I tearing yeah. up? It's the makeup girl, stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's the lighting. <laughs> Maybe there are tears. Thank you uh, for noticing. So I, uh, I was angry. I was very, very angry. Mm -hmm. I was angry at, at, you know, this particular lady doctor who was just doing her job, completely understand. I was also angry at my body, because mm -hmm. I miss health and wellness. I drink two liters of green juice a day. I, I don't eat meat. I'm, I take this seriously. I, I, I like to think I take great care of myself. So I felt myself very angry mm -hmm. uh, with, with just everything. So mm -hmm. I started doing research to t understand. I started speaking. My best friend had also had fibroids. My mother had fibroids. So I started just asking questions and getting a sense of, and then I started looking at statistics. I'm like, well, why is it nine out of, nine out of 10 like African women? Like, what is it about what we experience that mm -hmm. makes us stand out this way? And I started researching. I said, okay, I identify three top things, okay? One of the top things is period stigma. Mm. We can't talk about periods, so we don't talk about anything else that's connected to right. that. Right. Um, the other is that a lot of us are just in the dark about it. There mm. isn't a lot of awareness mm. um, that has to do with period stigma. Of course, because we don't talk about periods and anything that comes with it. We don't talk about fibroids. Hundred right? percent. So nobody thing, knows. I also realized that you know our health, most of our health sector, is informed by donor money. Um, and so attention and the cause um, goes to wherever the, the funds, donor wants it to exactly, go. Exactly, where funds. So when you go on the WHO website and you go to like African Women's Health, they don't mention fibroids as mm. a health concern. And so when the donors don't think it's important, where's the incentive to find it important? They find what they find important, right? Yeah. So I said, okay. Um, I'm going to do something about it. Um, and thankfully, I'm married to somebody who is a very <laughs> fast paced. He's like, okay, great, you're going to do so. Where, uh, so where do we start? So wait, like, you know, and I'm like, okay. So, I started with a documentary I did with my good friend Jessica Novova, who was mm -hmm. just finishing up her um, trip around the world. Mm -hmm. And we sat down and we talked about our fibroid issues. And she talks about periods every month, mm -hmm. um, especially since. Um, Periods is actually one of the big reasons that women don't travel and yeah. move and be free and wear white. And, mm. you know, there's just there's so much about periods dictates our lives. And so mm. just using that as a, a point of power and agency because mm. um, we have the power. But Nana, thank you for a lot of people are not very open about the negative things that they experience in life. Mm -hmm. So first of all, for being open about it on national TV, international TV. I know, TV, I'm like, wait a minute. You know, but then also <laughs> actually using your time, your your intelligence, your intellect, your efforts to do something about something that affects a lot of women who just can't admit that this is what's going on in their lives. Oh, wow, you're yeah. welcome. But I, I figured, you know, let me do something with this MPH and yeah. be, you know, be health adjacent since I didn't get my parents <laughs> that medical degree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will be following your work with five rights. But I, I will be wrapping up this conversation soon. But I want us to talk about Pure Persona. Um, now, I came across, I didn't even know it was your brand. I saw it on social media, it popped up. And I said, this is beautiful branding. Then I thought, wait a minute, this is a brand new company. It was launched during the COVID <laughs> pandemic. Who does that? Who does that? <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> Nana Konama does. Apparently, I do. <laughs> Apparently, I do. Completely. Um, so, I guess your question is why? Yeah, why? And, and just tell us about the product, you know, the inspiration. So, um, so viewers, we have the products on the screen. Yeah. There it goes. Look at look at them. Beautiful. My my babies, <laughs> my discovery kit. Uh, so, so you know, gosh, it's such a journey. And you know, with anything that you put your heart and soul into, um, it, so it really began around the time I had the revelation that I shouldn't go to medical school. Oh. Um, there are only a few times in my life that I feel like I've heard the audible voice of God, and okay. this was one of them. Okay. So I really felt in my heart that I wanted to get into like the beauty space, lifestyle space, wellness space. And I was like, oh, 
really know how to enter that. Like what? So I remember that day I was in New York. I had some downtime. I had maybe like two weeks. I had just finished my finals and I was just literally just waiting for graduation to roll around. And I was like, I'm going to book a solo vacation. I'm going to fly somewhere, stay by myself, do everything by myself. Um, and just use that time to sort of get like inspiration, either like inwardly or, you know, divinely. Okay. So I took that little JetBlue flight um, <laughs> down to St. Martin in the Caribbean. And I went to like a very quiet part of the island and I just sat down and I said, okay, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And I, I, con I conceived it then. It was in 20, 2013, but I did nothing okay. about it okay. for another two years. Okay. So in 2015 is when I started reaching out to possible partners um, to build the brand, formulate the brand. Um, and then we finally started formulating in maybe 2016. Mm. And it took almost two, two and a half years just to stabilize the shampoo alone. Okay, so this is a lot of research work. Oh, okay. my goodness. So this is a hair care brand. Yeah, okay. so it is a total wellness company, okay. but we are beginning with hair care. Okay. Um, because that's where inspiration has led okay. us for now. And what are some of the special things about the product? First of all, okay. it's special because I did it. Oh, <laughs> preach. That's the first thought. <laughs> but honestly, what's special about it is that I brought all of me into mm. making this. I brought that, you know, that biology degree yes. that's supposed to take me to med school? Mm. I brought I brought it mm. to this. You know, that public health and wellness degree that mm. was supposed to get me to the UN, well, I brought it to this product. Mm. And I worked, I used the knowledge of brand and um commerce and, okay. and my personal experiences and women like you mm -hmm. and our personal experiences um, and brought sort of my chemical and biological knowledge and worked with a lab for years. The, the shampoo alone took two years to stabilize what? because it's an innovation Amazing. around black soap. Okay. Um, and so our alata samina. Alata samina, right? Mm -hmm. And knowing when you get alata samina, because it's handmade, mm -hmm. it's not... Uh, the, pro the ingredients are not always evenly distributed. Okay, that's, that's what true. makes it beautiful. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's completely handmade. And so we worked with suppliers who I, I told them, this is where I want you to source it. It has to come from Ghana. It mm -hmm. has to come, you know, I was very, very strict about that. And um, it took two years to get the right combination of black soap that. It's amazing. Because it, it black soap is soapy. So yeah. to get it to a place where it's a non-stripping shampoo, to make mm. it a shampoo that cleanses your hair, but... It doesn't take all the moisture and the oils out. Exactly. Yeah. That was a lot of work, and that was fun. And the, the feedback loop, mm -hmm. I would use it. I'll send it to my best friend. I'll send it to my <laughs> sister. We'll just keep using it. Feedback, feedback, feedback. Um, and we just kept putting the feedback back mm -hmm. into the product. And I remember the last thing we, we, we added was mint. And I remember Ooh, smelling and I'd be like, you know, this could use some peppermint essential oil. It would be amazing. And we put peppermint essential oil in there for that nice tingle. Um, I see. I see. That there's, the, there's a video on the screen and there's a gentleman who has his beard being beard, groomed yes. as well. So it's for men as well. It's for hair. It's for hair. I, if you have hair. <laughs> So what about the people who don't have that? Some people in this don't have hair. Too. Some people don't have hair. So it's for your scalp. I'm sure they're wondering if they can grow their hair with this product. You know what? <laughs> Everything you want to do, we got you. Because your scalp also needs love. I can mention a few. <laughs> Mr. Philippa Sean, shout outs to you. Mr. <laughs> J.B. Alate, I love you. Benarata and the sales department. We have some bold, fine men in here. Send, you know what? Send them over. I, I took Kwame now. Oh. Where are they? I need to see them. I'll take you. When we're done with this, I'll take you to them. They need to see you. They need to. <laughs> the scalp needs love. Hashtag scalp needs love. But it, it's a beautiful product. And I mean, anytime a Ghanaian, and especially, I, yes, and I'll be biased, a Ghanaian woman does something great. Hey, <laughs> it's very just important to dance a little bit. I get so excited. And um, congratulations. Um, first of all, on coming this far in your life journey, Thank but you. also. Um, with, with, with this wellness brand. So, so what are the next steps with Pure Persona? The and where can we find the product? Okay. Because you need to make money. So <laughs> uh, I'll start with where you can find okay. the product because you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> so 
where you can find the product is online okay. at www.purepersona.com. Okay. If you want to go directly to the shop, then it's shop.purepersona.com. Okay. We um, can deliver same day. Um, that's for a little bit of an extra charge, but if you want standard delivery, sometimes we use, actually we use Ghana Post. Um, and I know we everybody's Ghana smirking. Post. We use Ghana Post and they haven't disappointed. Well, I'm just saying. To Ghana Post. No, I, I, Ghana I Post has really come through for us, even with our- So you're shipping nationwide. Yes, we're okay. shipping every, like every corner Ghana Post is able to get you there. Beautiful. Um, sometimes in Accra, if you're able to order before 10 a.m., um, they are sometimes able to get it to you in the same day, but usually okay. it's about in, within a crowd's one day. Okay. So purepersona.com. Um, yes, purepersona.com okay. or shop.purepersona.com. Okay. And on social media, where can we find Yes, on you? social media, we are all over the <laughs> internet. Um, where we are at Instagram at purepersona by Nana. Okay. We are on the LinkedIn, purepersona by Nana. And we're also YouTube, purepersona by Nana. Check out our YouTube. I mean, we have tutorials on there. Oh, brilliant. You know, I priorit we, for our content team, we really prioritize video, and so we go straight into video content. And okay. so um, we also have a great blog. You know, we're all over the internet. I'm telling Beautiful. you, we're kind of killing this Beautiful. internet game. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so now, now we have to end this now, but final words. Ten seek, seconds. Ten, <laughs> seek your inner beauty. Seek your inner beauty. Inner beauty first. Seek your inner beauty first. Yes. I like that. Nana, thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm so proud of you. I'm, I love yeah, you. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Viewers, we've been speaking to Nana Konoma Boating. She's the founder of Pure Persona by Nana and clearly a woman of many parts. If I were to read her whole bio, we wouldn't end this show today. Hi there. We hope you enjoyed the show. Make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share with your friends. This is Breakfast Daily on City TV. Join the Breakfast Daily team Monday through Fridays from 7.30 a.m. to 10. Join us for breakfast daily only on City TV.